what I like about the, these directives is that they're not, um, they're, they're, there's a lot of leeway for judgment in, a, a, uh, in the application of these things. And I'd like to go through several different examples that the FTC put out to, to sort of give you a flavor of how these things are pretty comprehensive. So for example, uh, the, first, the first principle, the distinction between the benefits of the product, the package, and the service, uh, the first example would be um, as follows. Um, there may be a plastic package containing a new shower curtain that's labeled recyclable without further elaboration. Well, because the context of that claim does not make clear whether it refers to the plastic package or the shower curtain, uh, um, then the claim is deceptive if any part of the packaging or the curtain isn't recyclable, unless it's just small minor parts. So without further clarification, the assumption is that if you say it's recyclable, both the product and the packaging has to be recyclable. Another example is a soft drink bottle that might be labeled recycled. Um, and so the bottle uh, is made, if, if the bottle is labeled as recycled, then the bottle is made entirely of recycled materials, but the bottle cap is not, because the bottle cap is a minor incidental component of the package, the claim is not deceptive in this case. So according to the FTC, it's okay to claim your bottle is made from recycled materials, even if the bottle cap is not. Kind of a reasonable interpretation. So the second point of the um, directive applies to overstatement of environmental attributes. So here's an example. An area rug is labeled 50% more recycled content than before. Well, the manufacturer maybe increased the recycled content of its rug from 2% of recycled fiber to 3%. So although the claim is technically true, it likely conveys a false impression that the manufacturer has increased significantly the amount of recycled fiber in this, in this product. So I love the fact that the directives covers, uh, say that something, although technically true, is not in keeping of the spirit of the directives. And so this claim would be deceptive. A second example would be a trash bag that's labeled as recyclable without any qualification. Because trash bags ordinarily are not separated from other trash at the landfill or at an incinerator before recycling, it's really highly unlikely that anyone is going to be able to reuse that bag through just through reuse or through recycling. So even if the bag is technically capable of being recycled, the claim is deceptive since it asserts environmental benefits where really no meaningful benefits exist. On the third directive, here's an example. This is about comparative claims. So an advertiser may note that its glass bathroom tiles contain 20% more recycled content. Well, depending on the context, the claim could be a comparison either to the advertiser's immediately preceding version of their glass, um, of their glass bathroom tile, or it could be comparing to a competitor's product. And so without any qualification, the advertiser should be able to substantiate with data that both of these interpretations are true. Otherwise, um, the advertiser has to be clear about which interpretation they mean. For example, by saying that 20% more recycled content than our previous bathroom tiles. A second example for comparative claims. And if the advertiser claims that our plastic diaper liner has the most recycled content, the diaper liner has more recycled content calculated as a percentage of weight than any other on the market, although it's still under 100%. The claim likely conveys that the product contains a significant percentage of recycled content and has significantly more co recycled content than its competitors. So if the advertiser can't substantiate both of these messages, then the claim would be deceptive. The comparative claims are pretty, pretty complicated, and so the FTC had four examples immediately for, for these, and then more you know, in, in, um, in their rulings on other items. So third example is an advertiser claims that its packaging creates less waste than the leading national brand. So the advertiser implemented the source reduction, their source reduction several years ago and supported the claim by calculating the relative solid waste contributions of two packages, the leading national brand and theirs. And so the advertiser should have substantiation that this comparison remains accurate because when they originally made the claim, it was many years ago and their competitor may have changed things. And the assumption is that it still remains accurate today. Finally, a fourth example. A product is advertised as being environmentally preferable. Now this claim likely conveys that the product is environmentally superior to other products, but because it's highly unlikely that a marker can substantiate the messages conveyed by this statement, this claim is deceptive. The claim wouldn't be deceptive if the marketer accompanied it with clear and prominent language, 
limiting you know, on what basis this environmental uh, superiority representation is made, which attributes, which particular attributes are the manufacturer talking about. Um, so for example, the claim environmentally preferable colon contains 50% recycled content compared to 20% for the leading brand. That kind of qualification would not be deceptive. So that's just the general principles. If you go through the rest of the um, website, there's a lot of very specific information about what you can claim about toxicity, what you can claim about ozone friendly, about recyclable, about whether or not a product is refillable, about renewable energy, and about badges and certifications that might be applied to your product uh, that suggest uh, environmental substantiation. So those FTC guidelines address the first aspect. Is a claim accurate? You can see that in the marketplace. I think that that's had a pretty big effect when you go through and you look at products and you look at services. You can see the, the impact of good regulations on being able to substantiate environmental claims. The other side about whether or not something is meaningful is you know, more open to interpretation for you know, what your um, level of responsibility is for a company to be environmentally responsible. And so whether or not something's meaningful beyond whether it's accurate, that's not something that the FTC has addressed um, beyond just specific marketing claims. So then the hotel placard card, it's great. Yeah, they're saving water by not washing your towels, but is that meaningful in the context of everything else? So regardless of the accuracy of a specific claim, we need to say, does the company as a whole spend more money marketing the greenness of their company or their product or their service? Or do they spend that money on actually achieving sustainability? So I went out and I did a quick case study. Um, so here's an example of an advertisement for um, Clorox Greenworks cleaning supplies. And this is a YouTube video. We're going to cut to that in, here and uh, let it play. And then we'll come back in a second. So cut to YouTube video. <laughs> Okay, so that YouTube video, it's cute, yeah, but it's kind of meaningless by itself. All you see is a lot of puppies in green color and, and, and cleaning supplies, and it's great. They say it's green, but there's you know not much in that advertisement uh, that speaks to whether or not the company is meaningfully making an impact on environmental sustainability. So I went and I dug in a little bit to um, Clorox's documentation about this stuff to see if, it was, if there was any sort of substantial um, greenwashing going on here. And so what I did is I went to the company page for Clorox and I looked into their investment documents. And so I took out, I looked at the 2014 annual report, the executive summary of their business operations. And here's a, sc here's a screenshot of what the cover looked like. And I dug into it a little bit to see what, what's going on with their sustainability initiatives. Um, you know, I searched through the document for uh, instances of sustainability and found 46 instances there. And I found some interesting things. For example, uh, they say that they use something called the Global Reporting Initiative Framework, which is something that is external to the Clorox company, which it provides a foundation for um, the board of a company and the accounting of a company to indicate whether or not they're making progress on sustainability reporting. And so they had a description of where they go to validate their claims. I thought, wow, okay, that's actually pretty good. They're, they're using some well-established guidelines for reporting sustainability. And then they made this claim in their document that over the year 2014, they've had 15% of their products have sustainability improvements. And there's, there's a, um, you know, a footnote there. And the footnote says that for the calendar year ending December 31st, 2013, 
All sustainability metrics represent cumulative progress against uh, calendar year 2011 baseline and percentage is based on net customer sales. A sustainability improvement is defined as either a 5% or more reduction in product or packaging materials on a per consumer use basis or an environmentally beneficial change to 10% or more of packaging material or active ingredients on a per consumer use basis or a 10% reduction in required consumption of water or energy use during consumer use. Okay, you know, to be honest, I was a little surprised to find this and a little bit impressed that they actually had thought through some of the details of what they mean when they say sustainability. This isn't honestly what I expected. And then when you look at what their company's strategic initiatives are, they have a number of things that are not strictly about making money. They have things about employee satisfaction, and then they have some specific strategic imperatives about environmental sustainability. For example, listed here, drive sustainability improvements in product and formulations and packaging, ensure key renewable materials are sustainably sourced. Well, that's kind of good. They have a strategic imperative, they have a mission statement, they have a way of measuring it, and they're reporting on their progress. That seems terrific to me. So where I was expecting to find this greenwashing claim because of this puppy commercial, uh, expecting it to be sort of superfluous, I was actually pleasantly surprised to see there was some good thinking going into how this company was managing its resources and our collective comments, our collective resources. So in summary, greenwashing is a negative term. It suggests that a company has a convenient but shallow concern for the environment mostly doing those things which also happen to um, cut costs um, and they claim it's for an environmental concern. The issues in evaluating a greenwashing claim are whether or not that claim is accurate and for the most part in the US FTC guidelines regulate marketing claims along those, guide, along those lines. And then secondly is it meaningful? This is more difficult to determine and requires digging into company documents and making an analysis of what the guidelines they're using um, what symbols they're using and what those things mean, whether they're adhering to them. A postscript to this um, lecture. You know, as I was doing the research and as some of our TAs were helping me out, we're trying to look for the origins of the word greenwashing. And it has kind of curious origins in terms of the first time it was used. And so if you search on the internet for it, you find this phrase widely described to, uh, about the term's origins. And the, the phrase that shows up over and over again is the following. The term greenwashing was coined by New York environmentalist Jay Westervelt in a 1986 essay regarding the hotel industry's practice of placing placards in each room promoting reuse of towels ostensibly to save the environment. Well, this is a quote from Wikipedia and it has sort of morphed into legendary status. All kinds of news articles and, and things quote this line from Wikipedia. We actually spent a little bit of time digging around trying to find that actual essay and we couldn't actually find that original essay anywhere. We found a lot of other people who couldn't find it either. And so while the term greenwashing and the way it's used doesn't hinge on whether or not we have an accurate um, origin for the term, it is what it is and it's used in common parlance effectively. But I am willing to offer bonus points to anyone who can actually find this 1986, re 1986 essay. In, in the process of trying to track it down among the staff that were working on it, we kind of come to the conclusion that we doubt it exists. Um, so bonus points if you can find it and um, bragging rights as well. Thank you very much.